they see it. So I think that's a question. You have a question? Okay. Um, my question is about the idea of having a relationship with Hashem. Uh, the basic of uh, any relationship is uh, communication. Uh, side A address side B. The side B responds in a reasonable time frame and so on. Uh, in comparison to human relationship, the Rav explained how a Jewish relationship with Hashem may work. I'm not quite sure what your what the problem is supposed to be. Is it that I don't hear him speaking back to me? That's the problem. Well, imagine a relationship with a person who's mute. He doesn't speak. He can't speak. He can make signs. You know, oh, right. Uh, and things happen to us. Things happen to us through the individual providence, which Hashem does for us. They definitely happen. So he's, it's not as if he isn't responding. He just isn't speaking. in a direct time frame, so you can connect in a short time frame, so you can connect your uh, communication to his response. But how is it working when we... Let me see. Let's say I have a doctor, and the doctor uh, sends me instructions for my, for my, my uh, diet and for my exercise, and then for my sleeping, uh, sleeping and so forth and so on. Maybe I write him letters and he doesn't answer, but he sends me instructions. And I live by those instructions, and I, be, I believe he's a doctor, and therefore his instructions will be good for me. Hashem Baruch Hu gave us a Torah, he gave us a Torah with rules in it. My circumstances are different from everyone else's circumstances, and the way the rules apply to my circumstances is different from the way the rules apply to anyone else's circumstances. And I know that he, he knows the totality of, of, of all knowledge, totality of all facts. So he's giving me instructions how I should live my life on the basis of what's going on in my life. I don't need, like the doctor, to see every time I eat a potato that I get stronger. I don't have to see that. What I want to see is after six months or a year or two years that I do get stronger and that I am healthy and so forth and so on. I don't want to see every, every time I interact, every time I follow a rule, I don't see a, a, a reaction or a, or a visible sign. I don't need that with a doctor. Why should I need that with a Kodesh Baruch Hu? So the, the way Rabbi describes it, it's not, it's not exactly a relationship. It's kind of like um, a, a one-time communication. In our case, we have the, the code of uh, Torah. And then it's kind of like, so there's no ongoing relationship. It's a relationship, but otherwise... Let me say, why, why must a relationship depend upon words? Suppose I ask someone for something and he hands it to me. Doesn't say a word. No words. I ask him and he gives it to me. That's not a relationship? Of course it is. Well, I don't see why words are the necessary building block of a relationship. Yeah, I mean, there's a deeper question to ask here, but at least if I can get away with a cheap answer, I'm getting away with a cheap answer. Yeah. To say that God has no beginning is like saying that the number six doesn't have a color. That doesn't mean it's transparent. The number six isn't the kind of thing that could have a color. To have a beginning means to be part of time, in time, where time has earlier and later. To say it has no beginning would mean that time has no beginning, because it has no beginning. That means there's always an earlier time that it was a, that in existence. That would mean that time has no beginning. But that's not what we mean when we say that God has no beginning. What we mean is he's not the kind of thing that could have a beginning or an end or a continuation or 6 o'clock or, or a Tuesday. The idea of time doesn't apply to him. He's outside the sphere of time. It's not that he's infinitely old. It's that oldness doesn't apply to him. It's a much deeper, much more, shall I say, absolute idea. It's just out of that category altogether. Yeah. The next question was, there's no reason to believe, but I was thinking, like, the people who do 
not do it in theory. You tell them, like, look at the world is constructed, how complicated it is. And like, this is what do, there is God. And they tell you there is even less probability that there is God, because on top of that, there is one who is that created everything that's impossible. Um, there are some deep questions here. Um, I would, just to get them to think a little bit, I would ask them, oh, there's even less probability that there's God, right? What's the probability that there's God? Give me a number. Tell me how you calculated it. There's no answer to those questions. Not everything has a probability. Not everything has a probability. Now, probability is a very difficult subject. When I was, in, I was teaching at uh, Johns Hopkins, I sat in a, a seminar, a friend of mine was giving a probability. At that time, there were five basic of theories and explanations of how probability exists. I checked recently, the same five are there. So nobody really understands how probability works. Nobody really understands what it is. But for example, if you take a frequentist point of view, which is the one that I find most convincing, a thing has a probability if there's a big class of things, and you're choosing a subclass, and you take the percentage, then you could talk about the probability of the next thing being that, of the, being that type. With God, isn't that there are lots of things, and some are gods and some aren't gods, and we pick them out of a bag, and, and, and what's the probability of getting God out of the bag instead of a sandwich out of the bag? There is no such thing. The idea of being, probable, being not probable, I think that's just fluff. Furthermore, according to standard theology, God's existence is necessary. It couldn't be otherwise. And in probability terms, then the probability is one. Probability is one, is what you say, for necessary truths. So if you're going to make a probability at all, it's more probable than anything else. So, you know, <laughs> the ideas of this, more probable, less probable, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's not serious. It's, not, it's not, uh, not a serious idea. In general, it's very difficult. Arguments for probability are very, very difficult because our probability is not well understood. And people make mistakes about how to apply it all the time. There was a terrible article, I mean, great research, in The Economist about 15 years ago, where they in interviewed people at hospitals, doctors making life and death decisions. And they asked them simple questions of probability. And the answers they got were off, off. Change the vocabulary a little bit, and you give an entirely different answer because you don't understand the difference between the two vocabularies. And he's making decisions, life and death. Shall I use this therapy or that therapy? It was a real expose. So the person's going to make a, an argument on the basis of probability. The very first thing you should say is, uh-huh. Let's, you know, let's work out everything, give definitions for everything, prove every statement you made. You know, don't take anything for granted. Pro probability is very, very difficult. Yeah, what's not? A doppelganger. Um, that also is based on a mistaken assumption. Let me leave that aside for a second. Uh, opposites can't exist without, I mean, opposite two opposite forces. They need each other to exist. They need each other to exist. Hmm. Well, I, I am aware of a description of Olam Haba. And Olam Haba is supposed to be all and only good. All and only good. Would that mean that Olam Haba is impossible? Because good can't exist without evil? Golly, I don't think so. I don't think so. What about in the Creator? Must there be evil in the Creator also? Otherwise, there can't be any good in the Creator? That doesn't sound right. I don't know. It just doesn't sound right. Um, so I, I think that this idea that you must, uh, you know, one can't exist without, without its opposite, hard to, uh, hard to imagine that it's a, a, a real piece of logic. Take, for example, people who are materialists. I'm not recommending it. I think they're dead wrong. But take people who are materialists. Everything is physical. Are they wrong by definition? Because if there is a physical, there has to be also 
the spiritual, because otherwise the physical couldn't exist. There's one by definition, because you can't have one without the opposite. I don't think so. They're wrong for a lot of reasons, but that isn't one of them. So uh, this idea that uh, a quality can't exist unless its opposite exists, I'm not impressed as a, as, as a piece of logic. However, the person may have been referring to something else. There's a pasuk. Because Baruch has set up a world in which there are opposing forces. He set it up that way. Not that it had to be that way. It's a piece of abstract philosophical logic. He set it up that way. And why did he set it up that way? Because he wanted there to be Bechira, free choice. And to have free choice, you have to have alternatives. And if you have two opposing alternatives, one good and one bad, and then the choice is a morally significant choice, choosing between good and evil. And then let's say you just erase the evil so it's no longer part of the picture, then there's no choice between good and evil. And then, since these choices are to facilitate what we're supposed to be accomplishing in this world, there'll be no reason for the other side of the choice either, because the whole point of it is to choose between the two of them. So here's an example. Um, at the beginning of the Second Temple, a certain group of great Rabbanim, Sadiqim, asked the Kodesh Baruch Hu that the spirit for idol worship should be taken away from the Jewish people. And it was. They saw it go. In the Second Temple, with all the problems that you had, idol worship wasn't one of them. But we know that at the very same time that idol worship ceased, so did prophecy. And the explanation that some give is as follows. Prophecy and idol worship are like um, a competition between something genuine and something which is counterfeit. In both cases, the person is looking for self-transcendence, something bigger than myself that I can attach myself to and achieve some meaning and importance for my life. It's just that prophecy requires an extremely high spiritual level, years or decades of preparation, and then only if a Kodesh Baruch who wants to, to bestow prophecy, no guarantee that he will. Uh, idol worship, which you attach yourself to the idol, and the idol is bigger than you are, and so forth and so on, usually requires you to have some strong drink and dance around the campfire. That's it. It's very tempting. If they're both going to give you, now watch the quote change my vocabulary, if they're both going to give you the feeling of transcend, self-transcendence, because you're going to feel attached to something bigger, why pay all the dues that you have to pay to achieve prophecy or divine spirit or whatever else? Why not do it the simple and, and cheap way? And that's an, something that appeals to a lot of people. The rabbi saw that struggling with idol worship was very, very difficult. In the first temple, it was far more widespread than, than, than we could uh, justify and tolerate. So they asked for the temptation of idol worship to be removed. Well, according to this principle of Zeh Umas Zeh Asal that he made a scale of choice between the good and evil, if you take away prophecy, then, I'm sorry, if you take away the desire for, for idol worship, then prophecy, which is the positive half, also disappears. You're not going to get prophecy free. You're not going to get it free. There's going to have to be a struggle. So you take away the evil side, which is attracting you, then you don't get the, the good side either, because then you'll be getting it free. So maybe that's what he was referring to. Not that philosophically a thing has, but because Rogo set up the world of opposites, and not all opposites, and not under all circumstances. As I mentioned before, the world to come is all good and only good. There's no evil there at all. Okay, yeah. Kedusha? Uh, the counter. So the counter for Nebula was uh, idol worship. Mm -hmm. And then for Ruach Kodesh, they gave an idea what the counter was. The counter for Ruach HaKodesh? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. That's a very interesting question. You see, you have to, you have to investigate exactly what is the difference in relationship between Nebua, which we translate as prophecy, or Ruch HaKodesh, which is Holy Spirit. Now the Ramchal 
does this in, in metaphysical terms, very interesting way. And this is also the difference between love and awe of God, the same difference. In prophecy, the person attaches himself to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. This is something like what we talk about in the world to come, the Vekus. The Vekus means attachment. It means the person attaches himself to Hashem. Ruach HaKodesh isn't, that, isn't like that. Ruach HaKodesh, HaKodesh Baruch Hu presents his Shechina to the person. The difference is, where's the person? In what locus is he? Is he in his, his own environment? Or is he change environment? Prophecy requires him to step up into a higher environment. Ruach HaKodesh comes to the person in his own environment. Obviously, prophecy is a much higher experience, much higher connection to HaKodesh Baruch Hu. So, um, and that's why I called it self-transcendence. You're going beyond yourself. Ruach HaKodesh is much less self-transcendence than it is having a superior orientation within your world, within where you are, rather than attaching yourself to something that's beyond where you are. So I suppose, I'm just now I'm, I'm following out your question, I suppose one could say that the opposite to, um, to Ruach HaKodesh is being disoriented, floating, pretending that nothing really matters, um, like the mid-century French existentialists, you know, that, or that only trivial things matter. Some people are convinced by evolution that I am just a slightly smarter squirrel, and that all that matters is my bodily pleasure and pain, my bodily success. Nothing else about me matters. That's a the denial of the person's humanity. And that would be the op opposite of having a divine investment in your human con condition, which enables you to orient yourself in a much higher way. This would be the other end of the spectrum, where you've just cut it out entirely. I'm guessing, it's a good question, maybe I should check it, uh, and see if there's any literature on it. Yeah? Do you understand the concept of hell in Judaism? So in Gideon, there is the term reference to Bilam, like, I don't know, burning and so on, and so on and so on. And I heard different exceptions. Could you explain once and for all what? <laughs> Could I explain once and for all? No, I can't explain once and for all. These concepts are, are very deep, very nuanced, and there are various ex explanations of them, and one would have to work hard to see how the explanations fit together with one another. So I can give you an insight, but I can't tell you once and for all. <coughs> First of all, um, the Ramban reports that he was challenged that for certain people who have had such certain terrible lives, their souls are burned up in fire. And these people said, souls can't be burned up in fire. They're not the sort of thing that is burned up in fire. That just can't be right. And the Ramban said, listen, God made the soul, right? He can make fire that burns the soul also. Don't tell me what God can do and what God can't do. Um, but then... Since the soul isn't a physical thing, the fire isn't just oxidizing. It's something else which deserves the term fire in some way that to know how it works, we'd have to know what it was. But here's one, one a, uh, explanation. Again, one of, among many, but one that could give you a perspective. Imagine the following. Imagine that at the end of a person's life, he's subject to total amnesia, which, by the way, it's worth, worth reflecting. Amnesia means you forget your life story. You don't forget how to use a telephone or a bicycle. You don't forget what food to eat. You don't forget the way to your, uh, you know, the, the, what language you speak. You forget your life story. Okay, now, the whole of his life story is paraded in front of him, and he's asked to evaluate evaluate what was done and how it was done and why it was done, and evaluate whether it was good or bad, how good and how bad. You see, we look at ourselves in a deeply prejudiced way, both positive and negative. Sometimes we're protecting ourselves and rationalizing and trying to think well of ourselves. Some people are down on themselves, and they are overly critical of themselves and don't allow reasonable explanations for what they do. Okay, if you don't know it's you, 
then all that is cut out. So you evaluate that whole life story. And after you evaluate it, memory is restored. Then you have to live with your life story the way you evaluated it objectively. That could be very difficult. That could be very difficult. I really did that. I didn't allow myself to see it before. So you're not to see it that way. So that's, that's one thing. But now the, there's a, a, an element here which I found very challenging for a long time. And maybe I'll share with you what I got to. It took, took me a lot of long time, a lot of effort. Oh, no, I got this from a friend. I didn't, I didn't get myself, this myself at all. What about the idea of eternal suffering? There are many sources that deny that. And where you have statements in the traditional literature which sound like it, they ha interpret them in such a way that it doesn't happen because it's very hard to, to reconcile eternal suffering with God's loving kindness created the world for only one purpose, to express only one characteristic, and that's loving kindness. How could you manage to, to uh, have this idea of hell, as you're talking about, which we take from Havdu and Torah Tomei, from the Christian ideas, right? Eternal damnation, eternal hell. It's in Sorry? It's in Gitu. Well, yes and no. I mean, you're using H-E-L-L, -L, which is English, which is a Christian word. And you're talking about Gitten, which is a Hebrew text. So maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't. And like the punishment of Freeman when they brought him and asked him what it was, you know, looks like. And they yeah, but that was only in our finite period. That doesn't go on. It doesn't necessarily go on forever. There are those who say that it can't go on forever. So there are really two things uh, to talk about here. One is annihilation. Some, like the Rambam, and like one strand of thought in the Ramchal, uh, say that uh, souls could be annihilated, just cease to exist. And then there are those which, I think this is even harder, that exist forever but are punished forever. So um, maybe I'll explain both of them because they're both um, questions that are asked. The idea of a soul ceasing to exist, I think I, I figured out an answer for. I've tried it on scholars, and they seem to be happy with it. Um, what are the two alternatives? Either you have a system like the Rambam system that some things that a person does make it impossible for his soul to continue to exist, and it simply ceases to exist. Or you have a system where everybody's soul is guaranteed to exist. Everybody's soul. What would be the difference between the two systems? Well, one difference would be, would be this. Let's imagine souls, people in the world to come. One principle that we have is that in the world to come, a person will be able to say, everything about where I am now and what's happening to me is because of what I did. I made my own position in the world to come. Everything is just. Everything is fair. If you say that you have the Rambam system, where certain souls can cease to exist, then everything about what, what that soul that is in the world to come, everything about it is because of what he did. It's all traceable to his actions. He could have changed it and ended up with opposite results. But if you say that a person's existence in the world to come is guaranteed, no soul is going to cease to exist because the Kodesh Baruch doesn't run the world that way. Up or down, richer or, or poorer, that your actions could, could determine, but not your mere existence in the world to come. Then not everything about his position of the world to come is due to his action. He hasn't earned everything. He hasn't earned his existence there. That was given, guaranteed externally to him. He's just earned his position there. So, if you think earning your position in the world to come is a good, you now have a competition between two goods. If you guarantee that every soul exists, then you have the good that no soul is lost, but you lose, for all of them, the earning being in the world to come. If you allow that a person's actions can be so disastrous that the soul ceases to exist, then some souls are lost, that 
from the point of view of loving kindness is a loss. But you gain that all the ones that do make it have earned everything, including their actual existence in the world to come. So I think you have a competition here between two alternatives, each of which has a plus and a minus. And I don't think it's obvious that the one that the Rambam is describing is the worst of the two. So if someone wants to bring an objection, how is it possible in terms of loving kindness that God could tolerate the loss of certain souls? He hasn't got a solid objection because he can't show that this way of doing it is, is uh, worse than the, than the alternative. Let me get to the second one, and then I'll, I'll take a question. Now, what about, what about suffering? So my, my chavusa, Amachayim Carmel, pointed out to me, when it says that the person will suffer forever, it doesn't say, listen carefully, it doesn't say he will only suffer forever. That it doesn't say. It says he's only suffering. It says he'll suffer. But at least open the possibility that it's a complex experience, some parts of which are suffering and some parts are not suffering. And it could very well be, given the balance between the suffering and the other, that if you would ask him under those conditions, do you prefer to continue to exist or would you prefer not to exist? He would say, no, I want to exist. So he himself will recognize that with the suffering, still his existence is worth it for him. Well, I think that changes the picture entirely. No longer is it so terribly objectionable. And then suppose that the suffering is because of crimes that he committed, and this is the just result of the crimes that he committed, so that his suffering expresses God's justice. So then there's something positive in the suffering itself. If you take those two features into account, I think it's much harder to make a case that you have something unacceptable here. That was my, my Caruso's idea. Yeah, you have a question? Oh, good, OK. Very good. These are, these are, these are deep questions. These are, these are really very fundamental questions. Uh, Scott. Hmm? Um, if, so I heard someone that breathing uh, someone running don't believe in eternal suffering if they commit between the end of the media and after a finite uh, crime Could we believe that Kahanim won't be as bad, like won't be so bad for some people? Because it's just like, let's say you have 20 Kahanim points, um, then you fulfill up the 20 points. And if it's eternal, then you have to have like an aftermath where, where Kahanim is pretty much zero suffering, or close to zero suffering for the next billion years after you reach close enough to 20 Kahanim points. Um. Then Kahanim wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good. Yeah, it's good, but it wouldn't be so bad. So the, your, your, your uh, argument is based on a premise that. Uh, uh, actually, this world is finite and can't have infinite consequences. But then I would ask, if that's true, how is it that doing a mitzvah could be rewarded forever? So I could understand if someone had an asymmetry, God's kindness is much more important than his justice. And for mitzvahs, we give infinite reward, even though it isn't earned. It isn't really earned because, according to your premise, a finite action cannot generate an infinite consequence. But, um, and then as far as justice is concerned, it can limit it to being finite. But let me try it a different way, which I think is more accurate in the description of what's actually going on. Um, I'll give you t uh, two analogies. One is the one that asked the question, and the other is the, answer, the one that answers the question. Uh, they build a new power plant in your area, and they raise the price of power. It's a new power plant, puts out more power, more efficiently, you know, okay, and you pay. You do a calculation after 10 years and you figure out how much did they invest, how much would they have gotten in the stock market, how much are they making with the new prices, and you figure out they've made a nice profit. They've made a nice profit on this power plant. So you write them a letter and say, you know, it was nice, you did it, we enjoyed it, we paid for it, lower the prices. You made your profit. I think their answer would be, we're selling a product. This is our price. You want the product? Pay for it. You don't want the product? Don't pay for it. Right? You're getting more and more power every day, aren't you? Well, so why shouldn't you pay for the power you're getting every day? Either it's worth a few or it isn't worth a few. Right? That's one attitude. But here's another attitude. 
There are people who, back to nature people, and they, they build houses in the forest with no metal parts and so forth and so on. This guy spends 10 years building his dream house in the forest. And it's three stories and it has flowers everywhere and so forth and so on. And now somebody says, you know, you put in a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you could have been paid for doing something for that, so forth and so on. Um, after 20 years, the person says to him, look, you put in so much, so much effort, and you got 20 years out of residence in this house. I think you've used up your credit. You didn't earn any more than that. So I think you should leave the house, or pay money, or something. He'll say, I built the house. It's my house. If I live in it forever, I'm never outrunning my merit. I'm not running my, my, my credit because my credit is in the house itself. And it's my house because I built it. If you think of reward in the world to come, it's sort of like money. Uh, I worked so and so many hours, they get paid so and so much money. So you could say, you, you lived, uh, let's say, 80, 80 years of active life, which means you would have died at 93. Um, so you had 80 years of effort. How much reward should you get? Well, you know. 80 years of tremendous, and then you've used up your credit. But if you've made yourself into a vessel that can absorb what's available in the world to come, then you never run out of credit. It's not a question of being paid for service to something else. The challenge was make yourself into the kind of vessel that can receive what's being offered in the world to come. Then it can go on infinitely. But if you did that, if you damage the vessel, then you might have to suffer the consequences of damaging the vessel also infinitely. So I don't think that you know, it's either you can get an infinite effect both on the positive and the negative level, or you can get the finite on, bo on both levels. But to say that you can get the infinite effect on the positive side, and you can't get the infinite effect on the, on the, on the negative side, because well, who could do it that way, but there's no necessity for it. So there's no, no necessity for worrying about it. That's what I think. Yeah, somebody else uh, had a hand up. Yeah. Um, does Judaism have something against pigs in the same way as uh, Muslims do? It's just an animal that they're not allowed to eat. Can a person bring a pig farm? Um, according, to the, according to the biblical law, pigs are not forbidden to have a uh, benefit from. So a person wants to raise pigs to, for the sake of footballs. You know, let's say you make out of the hide of the pig. There's nothing wrong with it. There are rabbinic considerations, and the pig plays a role in the in the Kabbalistic uh, uh, area, and we shouldn't a person shouldn't make a profit on it. But the, the strict biblical law is that uh, that it's not forbidden to get benefit from it. It's only forbidden to um, to eat it. I don't know unless it comes from, unless it comes from uh, the the uh, capitalistic side. I really don't know. In our literature, it's called davar acher, that other thing. <laughs> we often aren't, uh, aren't even, won't even won't even mention it. There are certain animals for which the Torah has a a, 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 a negative attitude, and I have heard certain references in in, in Kabbalah, but I'm not. I don't know, and I've mastered it. I haven't learned it carefully, so I can't, uh, I can't really report it. But if you talk about strict biblical law, it's not... Uh, a cheeseburger is much worse. A cheeseburger is much worse than pork. Pork is a simple prohibition. A cheeseburger is something which you can't have any benefit from. You can't even use it as a fertilizer. You know? You've just got to get rid of it. Yeah? The question is, uh, where does it mean like it's black and white comfort? Was it always uh, followed, like wearing black and white? Oh, wearing black and white. Yeah. Uh, was it always like that even in the times of Tanoim? Or like how did it develop? Well, black and white certainly wasn't in the time of Tanoim because the Gemara says that if a person finds that his evil inclination is getting control and he can't fight it, he should dress in black and go to a place where nobody knows him. And then hopefully that will... Uh, reduces desires over the zone. But it tells them to dress in black. It means not everybody's dressing in black. So it certainly is not true that everybody dressed in black. 
And I think, I think it would be safe to say that Moses probably didn't wear strimo. Uh, maybe I'm on touchy ground now, but okay, you know, probably not. Um, but I think that the opposite attitude that, well, it's just uh, styles that we imitate, we imitate the Goyim and so forth and so on, I think that's going too far, even though I realize I have people who differ with me. But I think it's going too far. We have a statement in Chazal, Im lo neviim heim, b'nei neviim heim. If people, if the Jewish people aren't prophets themselves, they're the descendants of prophets. If they do something, there's probably a meaning attached to it, even if it isn't formally a law. Maybe, yeah, yeah I think you could call it a custom, uh, even the kinds of custom is tricky, but, uh, but certainly, not, um, certainly not without justification. It's not certainly not arbitrary. Uh, and if you think about black, which I think is, uh, I don't know how far back it goes, uh, black is a color that has a, a real meaning in the culture in which we live. Black apparel is a sign of the fundamental value of what you're doing. Who wears black? Judges wear black. Black robes. Not white, not purple, not gray, not different in different countries, or different in the Western world anyway, they wear black. Um, what do you wear when you get a, an educational degree? You wear a black robe with that ridiculous hat with the tassel, right? Why? Why is it black? When you play classical music, play Beethoven, you don't play Beethoven in a t-shirt and shorts. You play Beethoven in black evening wear. Because the color black expresses something of very profound value, something that's really important. Justice is very important. Education is very important. And having been a classical musician, I'm happy to report that classical music is also very, very important. Um, so wearing black creates a certain attitude towards life, towards where you are, towards what you're doing. If, if you think, people think that you dress only for the, uh, the onlooker, it's not true. When you wear certain types of clothes, you feel differently. You move, your body language is different. Your, your breathing rhythm is different. You put on athletic th clothes, and I'm speaking as a person that does athletics all the time, uh, regularly. You put on uh, athletic uh, clothes, Wow, you know, your, your blood is going and your, your muscles are tuned, are, are tuned you're, you're ready to go. So it has an effect on, on how you look at your life also. So um, the black apparel, I think, is what, uh, what was needed in terms of the last couple of hundred years, maybe it goes back further than that, to live in a world where we're not in control of that world and we're not... Uh, we're not, uh, you know, we don't want to be part of the value system of that world to express what our feeling and our attitude should be towards what we're doing in life. Um, one thing that's carried by the idea of, of black apparel as your, as, your dress, as your dress is that what people would regard as the trivial parts of life aren't regarded as trivial because you're dressed in black all the time. OK, you go to the beach, you dress in a bathing suit. OK, that's true. That's true you do. So there are, there are definitely exceptions. But I think that the, the expression of gravitas, the seriousness of life, is something which is, which is captured by the, by, the, by the dress in black. And, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm not saying you know, it wouldn't be wrong. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that there has a meaning for our time for our period, and that shouldn't be ignored. That shouldn't be trivialized as simply, oh, well, that's what, the, uh, that's what I happen to be doing now. I don't think that's correct, even though other people disagree with me, but I've, that's my, my, my tradition that I learned from my Rebbe, that you, you don't, uh, don't trivialize things like that. What about white shirts? What about white shirts? Well, I, I would suppose the only, the only contrast would be black shirts. Um, the idea is it's plain. It's not decorative. It's not, uh, uh, and, and it's uniform. I believe in uniforms. Again, not everybody agrees with me there. But when you wear a uniform, clothes stop being a matter of discussion. If you don't, where'd you get that jacket? 
Oh, really? Look at that stripe. Hmm, that's the newest thing. Oh, where did you, you know, I have to catch up, throw out the old clothes because the styles are changing. I think that's a gigantic waste of time on something that's essentially trivial. It shouldn't be that way. If you have a uniform, you don't give it a second thought. You just buy the uniform and go ahead. I think that's a tremendous uh, benefit to your, to, your, uh, to your lifestyle. Yeah. I don't see why not. Um, I, first of all, the Gemara says, If the people will tell you that the, the non-Jews have wisdom, believe it. Believe it. If they tell you they have Torah, don't believe it. And the problem is that since this isn't regulated by law, except for one exception, which I'll mention in a moment, this isn't regulated by law, so something that can change. So the fact that I know what they wore a thousand years ago will not necessarily be right for me now. They were responding to their circumstances and we're responding to our circumstances. Now, you talk about being affected by the, the, the Goisha. Um, not everything that Goyim do is wrong or bad. Uh, I remember mentioning something that's part of Torah belief and a student said, but the Christians believe that also. I said, yeah, okay, so we are not anti-Christian. That's not what we are. We are what we are. We're Jewish. If we contradict something in Christianity, then we will hold that, it, that that thing is wrong. If we agree with something in Christianity, then we'll say, congratulations, you got something right. We're not out to be opposed to them. And we're not out to be opposed to the Goyim either. Otherwise, don't ride in automobiles, and don't, don't use uh, eyeglasses, and don't use telephones, because it's all invented by Goyim. So you have to choose what's appropriate and what's, what's available, and so forth and so on. And here, the Goyim have created a certain style which carries a certain meaning and which, in fact, we are affected by. That it carries that meaning for us also. Then we can make use of that meaning. No reason particularly not to do that. One of the Tversky Rabbonim said, if you think you can build a wall and keep out all non-Jewish influences, you're in a terribly dangerous situation because you can't and you won't be aware of them when they come in and you won't know how to deal with them. You're living in a fantasy world. And of course, I, I think it was a very profound remark. But then, when you have the Goetia influences coming in, not all of them are bad. Some of them could reinforce what the Torah says are important values. So I was in yeshiva, and we had people from different national backgrounds, Jews from different national backgrounds who were there. And it was very obvious that the Jews from certain national backgrounds had much nicer personality traits than the Jews from other national, national, uh, nationalities. It was just obvious, because they came from that Goyesha country, and in that Goyesha country, these traits were reinforced and emphasized. They had nicer personality traits. That shouldn't be denied. To, oh, well, if the country that are coming does that, we should do the opposite. If they're very careful of somebody else's property, we should be sloppy about the property, because we don't want to be like the Goyim. No, no. There's something positive that the Goyim have, which the Torah defines as positive, no reason, why, no reason not to take it. It's not that barrier. Yeah. So, another thing that seems that I, I think of is the traditional Shemitic Latinos and things like that. I mean, that, that's like a lot closer to home. Like that's in uh, the way we, we learn Torah, the way that we learn Tanakh, we, we, we reference things, but I think it comes from the Alpha tradition, and I'm pretty sure that's more like Shemitic, Malach and Alpha, or Malach and Alpha, Malach and Bay, but that was first thing, right? The, the what? Oh, oh yes, that, that, and the prokim, the, the chapters uh, are all are all d done by Goyim, right? Yeah, and we, but that's not kind of like I, I was thinking for the major thing, which is then that's like us like learning for from the actual. But we don't base anything on it. We we don't say since this is Shmuel Aleph, it has to be interpreted this way, and since Shmuel Beis is interpreted that way, we don't do that. We don't learn anything from it. 
In fact, we, the time, sometimes when we see the chapters which the medieval Christian put in, they're nuts. We have our own divisions, right? The Pei and Samach in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Sefer Torah, which define our paragraphs. And sometimes their, their chapters disagree with our paragraphs, so we just disregard it. We don't base any understanding of the, of the message on the, on the divisions that they made up. We just use it for easy reference, that's all. And not, and that's not, they didn't contribute to the Torah that way. It's interesting, sometimes you could see how off they were, like, <laughs> what's, what were going on in their minds and see that it wasn't really the meaning of what the text wanted. I'm sorry? Right, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the chapters were, they're separate works. They're, 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 not, they're not chapters in a book. They're separate works. Each one, each poem is a poem. Right? So there, there's not, no question about uh, the, the need to go into do that. Yeah. Oh, the hat. Yeah, the hat. So I, 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 I'll only tell you what I, I heard from a, a very good friend of mine who knows these things well. Let's, um, it's not this hat. But let's take this shrine, which is separate tales um, we use today, um, oh, I'll think of, not mink, we don't use mink. It's another, another, another animal. And somebody says, oh, you're using the tails of animals for your hat. How cruel can you be? Excuse me, there's a whole worldwide market for the animals, and they don't use the tails. So we take the tails and make hats out of them. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, but the truth is that in the mid-19th century, the czars of Russia, who had this program for, for decades and decades you know, of assimilating the Jews, doing something to stop them from being different, they made a decree that the Jews have to dress like the non-Jews. And there were riots in the streets, in particular certain Hasidic groups rebelled against it. And there was uh, you know, uh, terrible strife until finally one of the great rebbes with a very great uh, following, I think it was the Gera Rebbe, said, okay, we give in, we agree that Jews will dress like non-Jews, just we want the right to pick whatever style of non-Jewish dress we, we, we prefer. So the Zahra Rebbe, I don't care which style you pick, dress like non-Jews! Okay, so he told his followers in Russia to dress like Polish non-Jews. He told his followers in Poland to dress like Russian non-Jews. So they did. But they were still distinguished from everybody else. Because they were only the only people in Poland who dressed like Russians. The only people in Russia who dressed like Poland. Now the Gemara says that there's a prohibition for a Jew in his clothing to look like a non-Jew. Okay, there are a lot of commentaries on what does it mean, and maybe a yarmulke is enough. But there is an idea that a Jew should not be indistinguishable from non-Jews on the basis of his clothing. The, 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 the Rishonim take it down in certain ways. So someone whose whole outfit clearly isn't, Jew, isn't non-Jewish, that's, he's fulfilling that idea, you know, in spades. If a person has a yarmulke on, um, so then he certainly, no one else has a yarmulke on except the Pope and, and Cardinals. <laughs> when I started to become religious and I put on a yarmulke, one of my fellow Jewish students said, who do you think you are, the Pope? <laughs> um, so, but, but there is an idea of distinguishing yourself by your dress. So that, if somebody says, well, I see this in the old Polish pictures and old Russian pictures, and you're dressing like them. Yeah, sort of, right? But geographically, it wasn't so. Geographically, they were still separated from the local community by their dress. So the letter of the law of, the, of Jewish values was preserved, together with the letter of the law of what the, of what the czar wanted, he just didn't think of that, that we would think of that solution. That's one way that, that things like that came in. Yeah? Um, when it comes to someone who thinks that uh, we cannot bring this, and they also other people who put a cobra, um, what leniency do we have to not have put in a cobra for the time of burning and stuff like that? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I, I can't answer who it, what qualifies for a minion, what doesn't qualify for a minion especially when you have to take into account what resources he had to make a reasonable, a reasonable judgment. You're talking about evolution. Uh, I've done a lot of work on evolution. And some of it's recorded. Um, I'll tell you a story. I, I, when my 
first wife died four years ago, when I was sitting Shiva, a boy came in from Belgium. And he said, in Belgium, there's a national law. Every student must learn evolution. And he was in the yeshiva. But after he learned evolution, a non-Jewish teacher who taught them, but one of the things that they had to do was have a project where they made a presentation on some aspect of evolution. So this student took his book of, of evolution, and he looked up resources. He came across some of my work. And he just took each point in the, in the book and used my arguments against it. And that was his presentation. And the teacher sitting there, I don't know if he identified me as a rabbi or not, I just took the material. Either way, he had, he said, the teacher sitting there, point by point by point. And at the end, he said, you know what? You're right. You're right. The book is wrong. Maybe we should say something to the legislature to get them to, you know, to uh, reverse, reverse the law. Um, so the ability to come up with a relevant, um, a relevant conclusion that's well-based well, well is, is quite difficult. Someone else, you've heard, probably heard of Richard Dawkins. Um, I had gave a sheer on Richard Dawkins' positions, and I, I expressed my refutation of them. Somebody took a video of Dawkins Exp expressing his position, and took my video criticizing and put it together into one video. At least for a while, it was up on YouTube. I don't know whether it's still up or not. I don't do those things. But it was up and it was reported to me. So if a person had the opportunity to look at it and look at the critique and, and think it out and, and discuss it and debate it, that would be one thing. But the way it's taught is absolute pro propaganda and brainwashing. You're not allowed to think differently. You're not allowed to say differently. Um, <laughs> So I, I think that people who believe in evolution should just be pitied, and their belief in evolution can't be taken seriously. It's just, uh, it's just a complete ignorance and, and, mis and, and being misled. And to say, because of that, he's going to be considered an apicurus, you know, it's going to be very difficult. I, I don't know. I know there is some discussion about Moshe Feinstein has a tshuva on it, others do. Who can be counted for a minion? Who can't? I can't pay, pay us any judgment on that. I really don't know. But the vast majority of people who believe in evolution haven't a clue what it's really about and haven't a clue what the, um, what, the, uh, what, what the possible critique is. Having said all of that, I will share with you one fundamental idea. I've challenged all my students throughout the decades, write to your professors of biology and get an answer to this question. Um, Suppose I told you that I took a, a, a physical object, I, I painted X on one side, I threw it in the air, and three times in a row it came down on the X by accident. It wasn't weighted, it wasn't magnetized, the ridges didn't catch the airflow, it just fell on the X three times in a row by accident. Would you believe me or not? Oh, if you thought it was a coin, the probability of that happening is 12.5%. Okay, one in eight. That's not a terribly small pr probability. You could believe it. If it were a shilly gun with a thousand sides, I don't think you'd believe it, right? But I didn't tell you what the object was. So you can't figure out the probability. So you can't figure out whether or not to believe me. If somebody says something happens but in terms of probability, you need to have a way to calculate what the probability is so you can make up your mind whether it's big enough to believe or not big enough to believe. OK, so here's my challenge. You say that the uh, development of life is through a, an unguided, unregulated, unsupervised process. And there's a high enough probability that it happened that way to believe it. Tell me how you calculate the probability. Tell me what the probability is. If you can't tell me what the probability is, then you haven't given me enough information to make up my mind whether evolution is true or not. There's absolutely no reason to pledge allegiance to something which is advertised as an unmanaged, un uncontrolled process, which means that the outcome is based on probability without giving me any way to estimate what the probability is. That's just a mistake in logic, just 
I happen to be a logician. That's why I'm in love with this mistake. There are lots of other mistakes also. But this is a very simple challenge. You don't have to be very sophisticated to understand this challenge. And I say to you, write to your professors and ask them, how do you deal with the fact that you can't calculate a probability for something which you say is an unguided process? And then tell me I have to believe it. That's very, very just okay. And this person who, uh, who, who says he believes in evolution has never heard this, this challenge, never thought about it. So I think he just deserves pity. Nothing else, nothing else is, is, is relevant there. Yeah, what's not? Yes. I'm sorry, what? Last follow-up, that's the uh, last lesson in his mind. Yes, so I'm not answering what you were... Last words. lesson is that we want to say something? Sure. Oh, the last thing, look, um, we, have, we have in a, a, a very fascinating idea, Parashas Masse, which we just read. Now it says, uh, these are the exits for the trips, and these are the trips for the exits. In the same verse, reverses the order. Okay. You exit a place to go on a trip. You go on a trip to arrive at a destination. You don't go on a trip to take a trip. But that's what's being said. Your trip is for your exiting. So that means your destination is a temporary stopover. We call the completion of a time of, of uh, uh, let's say, learning a mesechta, we call it a siyum. See who means to complete something. And it is a completion. But there's another aspect to it also, which the Havla is brought out in the word, in an English word. When you go to a graduation, what is another word for a graduation in English? What is it called? A commencement. Isn't that fascinating? Commencement means beginning, not end. Because rightfully, they look at earning a degree as a stepping stone to the next pe period of development, to getting another degree or to getting a good job. Right? So when we talk about completing something, the completion is always a stepping stone to the next accomplishment. When a, when a person finishes a mesechta, typically he starts the next mesechta, especially if he's in the Dafyomi program. You always start the next mesechta because you're always in the middle. Someone said that the, in, in Bavli, you start with uh, Daf Beis because you're always in the middle. There's no real starting. You're always, always in the middle. And the way the, they're organized, they're all, you're always in the middle. The first Mishnah can have things that are really relevant to 10, ten different chapters in 10 different places and sort of taken for granted that you're, you're using all that material you, before you've even studied it. So, that, so I think the, the thing to think about is when you think about the last month since Pesach till now, and savor the fact that you were here and that you did accomplish and you, you did, uh, you did um, uh, gain various things. Also think about what these are platforms for, what these are foundations for, where, where, where it can take you, where it can lead you. Um, always think in terms of traveling for the sake of the next exit, the next step of traveling. Uh, says to Yeshua Kohen uh, I'll give you the ability to walk among these who are stationary. The angels are stationary because they have an identity that doesn't change. And we have the ability to progress even among those who are stationary. And the Gaon of Vilna says the picture that he saw there was a picture of heaven, which means we're being talking also about the world to come, that we will not be static in the world to come. We will be progressive in the world to come. And I will add one more thing because I learned it just recently. I still haven't fully uh, assimilated it, but I always thought of the progression world to come as a progressive experience. You experience more and more, more and more understanding of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, more and more a feeling of the, the love that he's bestowed upon us, the loving kindness, and all the rest. In the Maharal, it seems clear that there's activity in the world to come. There's activity. There's no Yetzirah, and therefore there's no free will, but there's activity. And that activity can be the result of the way you've trained yourself in this world so that there you can play out the training that you have by further and further activity. Learning Torah there is not totally dissimilar to learning Torah here. It's just that there's no Yetzirah to lead you into failures and, and distractions. So that was a brand new idea for me, but that's the idea. When Asad Ma'alchim gave you walkways among those who are stationary, even in the world to come, and they're walkways. They are walkways.
So think of that and prepare yourself mentally for coming back for the beginning of Elul.